On this episode of Skeptico, Alex talks with philosopher and well-known atheist, Dr. Stephen Law, author of Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked into an Intellectual Black Hole. Here's the example that I sent you and I have personal experience with because he told it to me and we discussed it on this show. And that's British psychologist and parapsychology critic Richard Wiseman, who has investigated probably more of these paranormal parapsychology claims like telepathy than just about anybody else. And here's his quote. I agree that by the standards of any other area of science, that remote viewing, and he later added in this quote, ESP, is proven. But that begs the question, do we need higher standards of evidence when we study the paranormal? So, Stephen, this is not the fairy in the cup over here. This is a guy who's reviewed hundreds of peer-reviewed papers and saying, good enough for any other field, but you know what? Not good enough because of the groundbreaking upset it would make for science. I think this is the best evidence I could give you for my claim about scientific materialism being woven into science as we know it. Mm. I think, well, well, presumably you wouldn't accept, you know, if I stick my finger out there and there appears to be a finger, a sort of fairy spinning around on the end of it, you're going to be very, very suspicious, aren't you? You're not just going to say, yeah, Stephen's proved to me that there are fairies. Uh, you're, you're going to require uh, much more investigation before you take my word for it that there really is a fairy uh, spinning around on the end of my finger. And why is that? It's because, you know, it, the, the prior probability that anything like a fairy exists is very, very low indeed, knowing what we do, you know, given our background knowledge. Stay with us for Skeptico. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sakaris, and on this episode, Dr. Stephen Law, Oxford-trained philosopher, noted atheist, and Center for Inquiry UK member. Now, the reason I bring up the Center for Inquiry, which is a very skeptical atheist kind of organization that seeks to debunk parapsychology often, that seems to be where it gets a lot of its notoriety, is that that's kind of the reason that I wanted to talk to Dr. Law. One of the questions that's been going on in my mind is, what are the philosophical underpinnings to this atheism, skepticism that we approach from so many angles? And in particular, I'm interested in what happens when we remove the religious argument, the the heated debate that seems to dominate the conversation of, of science versus religion, as if that's really a debate. To me, as you know in this show, I think we've moved way past that and have looked for the scientific evidence that is highly suggestive that consciousness survives death. So the question to my mind is, what do we do with consciousness survives death meets atheistic philosophy. And that's what I sought to do in this interview with Dr. Stephen Law. I hope you enjoy it. Today we welcome Dr. Stephen Law to Skeptico. Dr. Law is a senior lecturer in philosophy at the University of London and editor of Think, the philosophy journal for the Journal of the Royal Institute of Philosophy. He's here to talk about, among other things, his latest book, Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked into an Intellectual Black Hole. Dr. Law, it's a great pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for joining me. It's my my pleasure to be here. Maybe I should say I'm at Heathrop College uh, at the University of London. You know, I I, I was going to say that, but that has a lot less meaning to us over here in the States. We always just kind of associate it. The University of London goes, wow, that's pretty great. If I said uh, the college, then... Yeah, Heathrow College is pretty great. It deserves, it deserves to be more widely known. See, there, there, let's give it a plug there, because that will probably be more significant to folks over there. So uh, you are known, uh, probably to a lot of people, through your forceful yet well-mannered arguments against some of the religious silliness that seems to pervade, that seems to pervade our culture. And I guess you could say to many are the kinder, gentler atheist. Is that something that you kind of set out to do or just kind of naturally came from your personality? 
the atheism or the the kinder gentler. <laughs> the kinder gentler, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, I think. Yeah, I guess. Uh, I drifted. I've drift. I've always. I've been an atheism, an atheist for a long time. I haven't always been an atheist. Um, but after I became interested in philosophy and started studying it academically, it wasn't long before I became um, an atheist. But I, I wasn't. I wasn't really an evangelical atheist. I, I wasn't concerned with going out there and spreading the the, the word, as it, as it were. Um, I've become better known for that more recently, just because I've had more interaction with religious people, and I enjoy interacting with religious people. My my college um, is a religious foundation, uh, interestingly. So I'm very much plugged into. Uh, that world, and so inevitably, I've, I've, my research has become more focused on religion. It wasn't at all focused on religion just a few years ago, but I've become more and more interested in religion. And so far as the kinder, gentler face is concerned, um, well, I'd, I'd like to think I'd like to think that was true. Um, it's not. I, I probably have to work at it a little bit. I mean, every now and then, I can feel my blood beginning to boil. I just have to take a deep breath uh, and just think for a moment. But uh, yeah, so most of the time, I manage. I manage to create this facade, at least, that I'm <laughs> right, right, right. Well, well of, of course, I, I think it's more than a facade, of course. But your, your arguments invariably come back to philosophy. That's who you are. You're a philosopher, and I'm just wondering, you know, in a in a society where none other than Stephen Hawking has pronounced philosophy dead. Maybe you ought to just speak to the need we have for philosophy and announce maybe that philosophy isn't dead. Yeah, I don't think it's dead. Yeah, it just smells funny, as, um, <laughs> <laughs> as Frank Zapp said about jazz. Um, I, I think that philosophy is important. Um, it seems to me that, well, if you ask a philosopher what is philosophy, you're going to get a lot of different answers, of course. Um, there's no real consensus even about what it is that we're doing amongst philosophers. But my view is that, well, here's a, here's a, here's a fairly simple characterization. I think a philosophy is grappling with those big questions and puzzles that appear, at least appear, to reach beyond the point where the empirical sciences or mathematics, say, would be be able to provide us, even in principle, um, with some kind of answer. Um, so examples of questions or puzzles like that would be um, time travel. Okay, now time travel, uh, you can you can raise the question of whether it even makes sense, whether there's some kind of logical contradiction involved in the very idea very positive, you know, the very idea of time travel. It, it, it's ruled out logically or conceptually, perhaps. Now, if, if you can do that, if you can just by thinking through and unpacking the, the relevant concepts establish that it really doesn't make sense, then we, we've answered a, a, a fairly big and important question, a question that scientists are interested in too. But now we've done it from the comfort of our armchairs just by engaging in a bit of a priori conceptual reflection. So that's some real progress that you could make by doing you know, thought experiments rather than laboratory experiments. Um, and then other examples would be, why is there anything at all? Uh, on the face of it, that, that's a question that science will necessarily be unable to answer because when scientists explain things, they explain things by appealing to laws or causes which they have uh, discovered. Um, but then how could science explain the most fundamental laws? Uh, it, it couldn't. Um, those will necessarily be lie beyond the ability of science to, to explain, if, if, if that's what a scientific explanation is. So then we're, we're in the territory of philosophy, not just philosophy, of course. Uh, religion, too, tends to get involved with these big questions. You know, the, the other thing I think where philosophy really plays a role is in this whole business of paradigm shifting. Invariably, we're always talking about shifting from one paradigm to another. And I, I think, you know, it, it's so funny that Stephen Hawking would say such a thing because physics is, of course, 
been in the middle of a paradigm shift for the last hundred years. And I think who better than a philosopher using the tools of logic and reason to stand up and say, hey, wait a minute, are we stuck in a rut here? Are we are we making some assumptions that we shouldn't be making? I, I think it's a great tool. And it, it kind of strikes me as a, a valuable addition to this kind of thought process. So paradigm shifting, right? Yeah, no, I think that's right. Um, was it Einstein who uh, partially credited his reading of Hume? Um, with his, the, his later subsequent discoveries. It was this that kind of got him fired up, got him motivated, got him asking the kind of questions that le- then led him on to making these, these new and important developments. Philosophy is very good at that, getting people to take a step back and que- getting people to question the things that they have hitherto taken for granted, even, even within a scientific setting. And that is often very fruitful indeed. Dr. Law, I understand that you've taken a rather interesting and unconventional path to becoming an Oxford-trained professor of philosophy from a postman to a leading intellectual. Do I have that right? Uh, tell us a little bit about your background. Yeah, you have the postman there, right? Certainly. Uh, yeah, I used to be a postman. I was uh, I was the postman for the for Girton, uh, part of Cambridge, for around about four years. Every other week, I would deliver the mail very badly to houses. Uh, I had very long hair back then. It was right down my back. Uh, so I was a hippie. The hippie postman of Gurdon. Uh, they'll probably remember me. Uh, so, yeah, I started out there, became interested in philosophy. Um, I became interested in philosophical questions. I, I wasn't really aware that there was this subject philosophy to begin mm-hmm. with. I just knew that I was interested in time travel and whether this might be a virtual world rather than a real one and whether or not God exists and what makes things right and wrong and so on, and so on those kind of questions. And then I realised that actually you could pursue this stuff um, at university. And once I realised that, then there was no stopping me. I applied as a mature student and some, by some miracle I gained entry to a university and I've never, never left. I think that's very humble. I don't know many postmen who could decide that they are going to get a PhD from Oxford and then just go about doing it. But we'll leave that aside. Let's let's talk for a minute about your most recent book, Believing Bullshit, a uh, provocative title. Who's it written for? It's written, I guess, one group of people that I wrote it for. Were, I've, got, I've got fairly young kids. Um, I was kind of a late starter with having children, so I have fairly young kids. And it, it concerns me that there are all these belief systems out there in the world, um, many benign, but some not quite so benign, and cert- certainly belief systems which are capable of acting like a black hole, an intellectual black hole. You, you get too close and you start getting sucked in, and before you know it, you're trapped in there and you can't. You're becoming an intellectual prisoner. And so, sometimes, sometimes they're quite benign, but sometimes they're really quite exploitative, financially exploitative, for example. Uh, they, they take people away from their friends and families. They make people give up opportunities that, that they really should take. Um, and I, it concerns me that our cultural environment contains those kind of dangerous belief systems. And I think we should all know the warning signs, if you like, of an, of an intellectual black hole. So the book was really written for, for everyone, but particularly for young people who might come into contact with a belief system like that, um, just to give them some awareness of what the warning signs would be, uh, what the danger signals are, so that a little red light comes on in their head the next time some wide-eyed true believer thrusts a leaflet into their hand as they walk down the high street and says, have you heard the truth, the good news, or whatever it happens to be. Here's a quote from the book. When I talk about a bullshit belief system, it's not the content I'm suggesting is bullshit, but rather the manner in which its core beliefs are defended and promoted. Tell us a little bit about that. Sure. Um... So I talk about all sorts of belief systems in the book. Um, and, and, in, and in some cases, the core beliefs could be true. Um, so I'm not attacking the claim that the beliefs are true in, in, in many cases. What I'm pointing out is the way in which people will defend their beliefs, begin to build a wall around them, 
that immunizes their belief system and protects it from any kind of intellectual threat um, and creates a kind of a veneer of reasonableness, of sort of faux or fake reasonableness. Um, it's, it's the mechanisms that are used, that are applied to generate that kind of structure around the beliefs that then turns it into a sort of mental prison for the true believer. It's, it's those mechanisms that I'm, that I'm most interested in. In, and I, I, I identify a number of those in the book. Of course, when we talk about bullshit belief systems, the discussion often comes back to debates about Christianity, a topic you're very comfortable debating and have debated. Some of the leading Christian apologists and folks can find that on YouTube or in any number of places. I guess I feel like when I hear some of those debates, I want to go, wow, is that really where we're at? Are we still talking about the empty tomb and debating that? And on one hand, I guess maybe that is where we're at. On the other hand, I guess I want to move the discussion forward and say, okay, you know, that culture war debate is really over. You've won. Here you go. But let's move on to a more interesting culture war battle. And that one, I think, is somewhat even obscured by this other debate we're having about, you know, empty tomb and all that stuff. And that has to do with scientific materialism and whether or not we are anything. These big picture questions, meaning of life kind of questions. What do you think about that? Are we stuck in a rut a little bit with the Christian versus atheist debate? And what about this idea of moving the debate to this notion of scientific materialism. Any thoughts on that? Well, maybe I should just point out that um, I'm not wedded to uh, naturalism or materialism um, as a philosopher. In fact, not that many philosophers are. Professional philosophers um, tend to be fairly divided on the naturalism issue. There was a Phil Papers survey done um, a few years ago of professional philosophers and graduate students around the world. Only, only around about 50% sign up to naturalism. Um, mind you, only about less than 15% sign up to any kind of theism at all. So they don't, they don't, they don't believe in God, very many of them, the vast majority of them. But still, neither do they sign up to naturalism necessarily. Um, you, you, you often find debates about religion set up as debates between, on the one hand, religious people, and on the other hand, the, the naturalists and the materialists. Um, and the truth is that there are, there are other options. You, you, you know, it's not either or. You don't have to be one or the other of those two things. Well, well but really, you know, I, I understand where you're, where you're coming from on that. And, and this now becomes one of the problems, I think, that a lot of folks, including myself, have with philosophy. And you don't fall into this as much, which I really appreciate, is that I think we have to stay grounded a little bit in the, in the culture that we find ourselves in and in the culture war debates that we find ourselves in. So this question of Christianity or this question of God or no God, really, the atheism question, really, I think, has been set up as a question about meaning, materialism, Richard Dawkins, we are biological robots, that life has no meaning, your consciousness is an illusion. That is really the core intellectual thrust of atheism. So it might not be your atheism, but I think you'd have to concede that, you know, that is the core thrust of the atheism debate, if you will. And I, I would suggest to you, go, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm not sure that's true. I mean, there clearly are some very vocal a atheists who are also, you know, very much wedded to materialism and naturalism. But there are there are quite a few, like me, that, that are not. Um, so, you know, there are a range of views. And it, it what, one of the things that bothers me is, is the way in which uh, religious people think that they can establish atheism is false by simply finding fault with naturalism or materialism. So if they could just show, for example, that there's the consciousness cannot be accommodated within um, a sort of naturalistic worldview, well then that's atheism sorted. You can't be an atheist now. That doesn't follow at all. Um, that's just a poor argument against atheism. I mean, I'm an atheist. I don't believe in God or gods. But that doesn't mean that I have to sign up to naturalism or materialism. Not at all. I could be 
a mathematical Platonist, for example, <laughs> as many mathematicians are, aren't they? They they believe that mathematics describes some non-natural realm. Well, I could take that view without believing in God. So I could be an atheist without being a naturalist or a materialist. I'm going to try and dance around that because speaking of intellectual black holes, that's an argument we could get into about God and then defining God and your definition and all that. I, I, I do want to come back to this, though, because we're on to something, and that's that I want to talk about meaning, meaning in life, meaning in the universe, because I think that's one of the hardest challenges that atheists face. And whether it's explicit or implicit, I think it's where people are coming from, and that's that, hey, you're telling me, Mr. Atheist, and I'm not hanging this on you, but you're telling me life has no meaning, and yet I know my life has meaning. I know it kind of intuitively, I know my life has meaning. So convinced to me that my life doesn't have meaning. And I think we can back that up. Again, I can go to Richard Dawkins and we are biological robots, or I can go to Daniel Dennett and you are an illusion. I mean, this isn't this one of the core tenets, if not of atheism, of the cultural message that we get about atheism. And that is that life has no meaning. Well, that's an enormous question, whether life has meaning or not. Um, I, you know, I, if you're interested in what I think, I would read my book on humanism, a very short introduction to humanism, because it's got a whole chapter on the meaning of life um, in it. Um, I couldn't begin to unpack all of the issues here, but it seems to me that, first of all, both theists and atheists have a problem so far as the meaning of life is concerned. It's all very well saying, hey, you, Mr. Atheist, you explain the meaning of life. But the truth is that when you listen to the accounts of a meaningful life that are given by the religious, they often turn out to be very unsatisfactory too. Being told, for example, that you were made for a purpose uh, and that gives your life meaning, um, that that's the explanation for why it has meaning, it, that's not a very good explanation. I mean, suppose it turns out that I was indeed made for a purpose. Suppose we all were uh, engineered by aliens to clean their toilets and they're coming soon to pick us up and take us off and deliver us to their toilets where we'll be find ourselves happily slaving away forever, uh, doing the job that we, we were always meant to do. Does that, do you now feel that your life has meaning? Not at all. Uh, having a purpose, being made for a purpose, does not give your life meaning, certainly, certainly not necessarily. And so these quick, easy, glib religious answers are not really good answers at all. Um, they, just create the, they just create the illusion that meaning has somehow miraculously been conjured up by the religious by the religious person, but on closer examination, the meaning just runs through your fingers. So meaning is a problem for everyone. I don't think it's that atheists particularly have a problem any more than theists. I agree for the most part. I do think that then we have to be explicit and say biological robots, Richard Dawkins is a silly notion. Consciousness is an illusion. Daniel Dennett is a silly notion. And put it kind of, if we just want to kind of sort it out and say all these goofy religious dogma concepts are silly and we can kind of throw them away, then, you know, let's throw these guys away too, because I don't think any of that really makes much sense either. I, I always think, and I sent you this quote, so I'd love to get your comment on it. I always think of the uh, the quote I heard from the uh, famous Nobel Prize winning French philosopher, Albert Camus, who said, there's really only one serious philosophical question, and that is suicide. And I think... You know, it's pretty, it's very French, very French. But I think it gets the heart of this meaning. I mean, if you really think life has no meaning, then w w what is there? I mean, w what really could possibly be a motivation for life? I think it's almost a given that our life has meaning because that's how we live our life. That is that we, our life is defined by the decisions we make. How we live our life is what, is what we believe. And no one lives their life as, it, as if it has no meaning. No, but are you suggesting that the life of an atheist is, uh, is meaningless? Well, I, I'm suggesting that, that, that this is the philosophical root that has to be fully taken in and fully addressed. So it, I, I think it gets obscured because I understand, I get it, you know, inundated with religious bullshit, inundated with a religious 
black hole that just kind of is confusing and doesn't make sense and is infused into our society in a way that just makes you question the institutions that we have around us. I get all that. But when you get to the other side of that and you say, well, then wait a minute, am I buying into this other idea of my life has no meaning? Of course it's not, because that doesn't make any sense either. So we're kind of, I, I think it's facing the reality that we really are between these two worlds if we think things through. But it's, it's a classic philosophical conundrum, isn't it? You know, what is the meaning of life? What makes life meaningful? And in fact, there are plenty of um, atheist answers to that question, which um, perhaps they're not going to, you're, you're not going to find them very attractive answers or very plausible answers. But the fact is that the religious answers tend not to be very plausible either when you start to look at them more closely. It's just the philosophical puzzle um, in much the same way as, I don't know, why is there anything at all? It's a philosophical puzzle. There are all sorts of philosophical puzzles. And we, what I think we should do is we should acknowledge that they're tough and that we don't necessarily know the answers to them. But it doesn't follow then that the, the default position must be to kind of a, immediately appeal to God or the supernatural uh, and, and suppose that that then must be the correct answer. I can't see that that's, that's right. Totally agree. But, but neither should we appeal to or elevate science to another, uh, another kind of God, to a scientism, to a, mm. like I said, you know, a, a Daniel Dennett, biological robot meme, you know? I mean, that stuff, when you really break it down, doesn't make any sense. But I've kind of already said that. We've covered that ground. I don't know if it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you know, whether or not, um, you know, precisely what the relationship is between mind and body, uh, is a is a very very interesting question. Um, I don't sign up to any particular view uh, so far as that question is concerned. But I have to say that there is a pretty good looking case for saying that uh, if the mind is to have any kind of effect within the physical natural realm, it somehow has to be part of that realm. Um, uh, I, I, you, you know, I'm not necessarily endorsing this argument, but there's not. There's a pretty look, good-looking argument for saying that if the mind is to have effects within the physical world, it must be physical. Because what we know of the physical world, everywhere we look, we find that physical effects have physical causes. And so, if that is true, then the mind must itself somehow be physical. We're going to have to accommodate it within the physical in order to account for its ability to cause physical behavior, for example. Isn't that, a, isn't that a fairly plausible looking argument? Perhaps, but I'd say we better be damn sure that that's the way it is because we've built this edifice of scientism around that. Our whole culture is built on that. And when we start seeing cracks in the foundation of that, which I think we do, and it, it sounds like you're at least somewhat open to examining those, I, I think we really have to step back and look at what's at stake. Let me, in that spirit, return to your book, Believing Bullshit, with another quote that I liked. The more we appeal to mystery to get ourselves out of intellectual trouble, the more we use it as a carpet under which to sweep inconvenient truths or discoveries, the more vulnerable we become to deceit, deceit by both others and by ourselves. Let me juxtapose the quote from your book with a quote from biologist Rupert Sheldrick, author of The Science Delusion, one of these folks out there, among many, many that I've spoken with and are out there who kind of see this materialism, scientific materialism, and the position of the folks like Richard Dawkins as a major impediment to really moving forward and answering some of these big questions. Here's what Sheldrick says. For more than 200 years, materialists have promised that science will eventually explain everything in terms of physics and chemistry. These believers are sustained by the faith that scientific discoveries will justify their beliefs. So, of course, he's being a little bit provocative in kind of using these words of religion. But I, I think he has a point when he talks about this promissory note of science and that really being a part of scientism of just, hey, wait a minute, boys, we got it covered. Just give us some more time when really when we look at the long history of science, for the last 200 years, we see progress in some areas and in other areas, the kind of questions we're talking about in terms of 
consciousness, in terms of meaning, we see very little progress or, or worse yet, we see progress that's leading us in another direction that we're not willing to follow because we're married to this idea that unless we can measure everything, then we're going to be lost. Right. Well, I, I, I don't sign up to scientism. If scientism is the view that ultimately every meaningful question can be answered by an application of the empirical sciences, then I don't sign up to that. But then the vast majority of scientists don't sign up to that either, actually. They acknowledge that moral questions, for example, are questions that science is not well-placed to answer, um, and many other questions too. And in fact, even Richard Dawkins in The God Delusion makes it clear that he doesn't think that science can answer every question. So very, very few people actually are wedded to scientism. Um, also, very many scientists are not wedded to materialism because, as a matter of fact, they're religious, right? Many Christians are scientists. They're clearly not materialists, but they really do believe that by using science, they can really understand a great deal of the world around us, and indeed that science is the best tool for finding out about that world that we see around us. So I just don't buy this, oh, science is all about materialism and scientism. That just seems to me to be an excuse for or a way of explaining away why it is that maybe science scientists aren't signing up to what it is that Rupert Sheldrake wants them to sign up to, maybe. Well, I, I don't know on that last part. I think there's a, a deeper point here when we talk about scientific materialism and this idea that, uh, you know, when it comes down to it, science is nothing if we can't measure things, right? And the notion that we are something more than our brain, that mind equals brain isn't true. We are not biological robots. And you said earlier that falsifying that doesn't mean an end to atheism, and uh, we could go off on that discussion. I think to a certain extent, falsifying that does bring an end to scientific materialism in a way that it's currently deeply, deeply embedded into our culture, certainly into our academics. And that is that, you know what? If mind does not equal brain, <clears throat> if your mind isn't solely a result of the chemical neural activity inside your brain right now, then we got a huge measurement problem. And we have to start asking questions like, you know, how many angels fit on the head of a pin? Those kind of questions that we do, you know, we left long ago because we realized where they take us. But I really think, I don't know how you get around it from a philosophical standpoint. I think that's what's at stake with this yeah. mind equals mind equals brain problem. Well, I can see. Yeah, I can see that what you're doing there is you're saying, well, look, here's a here's a veil here, and the stuff this side of the veil, I can put my tape measure up against it and I can measure it. But hey, if there's stuff behind the veil and I can't I can't get my tape measure back there and do the measuring because it's the mind and the mind isn't physical even, um, then there's a real problem about scientific investigation of, of, of that phenomenon. But I don't think I'm saying that. I think that's what Stephen Hawking is saying. I think that's what uh, Richard Dawkins is saying. I think that's what a lot of people are saying who are like, hey, don't really go there too far because you don't want to fully embrace what that means. But tell me why you don't think that's. Well, just because something is not observable um, doesn't mean that it's not scientifically investigable. And science deals oh, but, with... Well, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on, wait a minute. I don't think that's true. Tell me, tell me how that could... How, how could we measure something we can't observe? Well, you can investigate things by investigating their effects. You can't observe electrons. You can't observe the distant past of this planet... You cannot observe a living dinosaur. Um, all of these things are beyond our ability to observe, but we can still draw reasonable conclusions about these portions, these unobserved portions of reality, by thinking through the consequences of beliefs in such things. If it's true that dinosaurs once roamed the Earth, then we should find certain things um, embedded in the ground now, for example. Um, there should be certain clues that we should be able to discover. If it's true that crystals have certain effects on people's psyches by some supernatural means, we can do some experiments to see, double-blind experiments, to see whether or not the crystals have those kinds of effects. If prayer has the ability to cure people, 
then we can do, again, double-blind experiments, and they've been done to see whether petitionary prayer really does have the ability to cure heart patients. So, so just, because the, just because the phenomenon itself is behind the screen doesn't mean that you can't actually empirically investigate it. And I thought that actually Rupert Sheldrake was very much in favour of that kind of investigation. I think he is, but I think what he's alluding to is that we have to be cautious in the same way you're talking about. In, in a way, that's why I like to juxtapose those two quotes, yours and his, because in a way you're talking about the same thing, about sweeping mystery under the rug. And what Sheldrick is warning us is don't think that science isn't already sweeping a whole lot of mystery under the rug. I, I always think of the quote from the famous uh, physicist Richard Feynman, who says, anyone who claims to understand quantum theory is either lying or crazy, right? So there's a whole lot of mystery that is at the core of physics as we understand it, that we just conveniently sweep under the rug because we don't want to deal with it. Or as you put it, we put it on the other side of the veil and say, oh, we can't really understand it, but we can kind of fool around with measuring these effects. When I think what you've really done is you've kind of switched the game here because the game was about that we have this closed loop system. Everything that is physical is manifested in a way that we can measure and measure it. And if we change that assumption, I really think we've kind of changed the game in a fundamental way. But Obviously, you kind of see it somewhat differently. I have no problem at all with uh, acknowledging that some things are currently beyond our understanding and maybe in principle beyond our understanding. Um, my problem is with those who, when their belief in some phenomenon has been challenged, they say, you know, there's a serious intellectual threat. The evidence very strongly suggests that what they believe is not true. Say they believe in petitionary prayer, or they believe that miracles have some, so um, crystals have some amazing effect on people's psyche, and the experiments are done, and the evidence is in, and it looks very much as if it's simply not true. And they respond by saying, yes, but there are more things in heaven and hell than are dreamt of in your philosophy. Right? So that's yeah. what they say at that point. And what they're doing now is they're using the veil as an immunizing device to, to protect what they believe um, from any kind of threat. And now that is, uh, it seems to me, intellectually very dubious indeed. To some extent, we all do that a little bit. But the more you do it, the more vulnerable you become to deceit by others and by yourself. You end up kidding yourself in the end. So it's that kind of appeal to mystery that bothers me. I have no problem with mystery. Hey, there are plenty of them, and they inspire us to keep looking and keep searching. And it may be that some will never be solved, and it may be that they are necessarily ins unsolvable. But let's not use mystery as a kind of get out of jail card whenever we find ourselves cornered in an argument. I mean, that's, that's not all. No, fair enough. But as you know, you're also provost for the Center for Inquiry in the UK, which I'm not sure how it's perceived in the UK, but in the US is known as basically a debunking organization for all manner of paranormal claims. And that kind of leads me into directly into this last topic I want to talk to you about in terms of philosophy of science. And Gosh, as you were saying that, what just kept ringing through my ears is what I hear all the time, this idea of extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. I mean, you want to talk about sweeping mystery, sweeping evidence that you don't like under the rug. Here is the mantra that the whole Center for Inquiry crowd pulls out. I mean, I guess I should start with that. I see that as just an intellectually feeble kind of pronouncement. Extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. That is anti-science. I mean, isn't it? Why, why do you think that? <laughs> well, well, we've built this whole institution of science, the whole process of peer review, the whole process of self-correction around this idea that, that we will all together discover what is real, what is not real, what is extraordinary, what is not extraordinary. So then the idea that that kind of after the fact, after the results come in, we say, you know, that's pretty interesting results, but I deem that to be extraordinary. Therefore, you need an extra level of proof on that. I, I, I just think is, is just silly. Oh, okay. I think I see where you're coming from. Well, the way I have understood 
uh, that principle, extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, is that, well, I mean, suppose, suppose um, I tell you that over there um, I've got uh, uh, a mobile phone and a cup, okay? Um, and uh, I do this, there's the mobile phone and the cup. Uh, you're going to go, hey, yeah, that's good enough for me. <laughs> Steve's got a mobile phone and a cup. If I now wheel out a, um, a fairy, which I make dance on the end of my finger, and I go, there you go, fairy on the end of my finger, okay? Are you going to go, yeah, Steve's got a fairy on the end of his finger. I'll, I'll just take his, oh, that, fair enough. I'll, 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 I'll accept that on, 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 the, on the basis of the same kind of evidence that I accept that he's got a cup and a mobile phone. I bet you would not. Sure, sure, but we're talking about, we're talking about science here. We're talking about peer-reviewed. Here, here's the example that I, I sent you and I have personal experience with because he told it to me and we discussed it on this show, and that's British psychologist and parapsychology critic Richard Wiseman, who has investigated probably more of these paranormal parapsychology claims like telepathy than just about anybody else. And here's his quote. I agree that by the standards of any other area of science, that remote viewing, and he later added in this quote, ESP, is proven. But that begs the question, do we need higher standards of evidence when we study the paranormal? So, Stephen, this is not, you know, the fairy in the cup over here. This is a guy who's reviewed hundreds of peer-reviewed papers and saying, you know what, it's good enough for any other field, but you know what, not good enough because of the groundbreaking kind of upset it would make for science. I think this is the best evidence I could give you for my claim about scientific materialism being woven into science as we know it. Mm. I think, well, well, presumably you wouldn't accept, you know, if I stick my finger out there and there appears to be a finger, a sort of fairy spinning around on the end of it, you're going to be very, very suspicious, aren't you? You're not just going to say, yeah, Stephen's proved to me that there are fairies. Uh, you're, you're going to require... Uh, much more investigation before you take my word for it that there really is a fairy uh, spinning around on the end of my finger. And why is that? It's because, you know, it, the, the, the prior probability that anything like a fairy exists is very, very low indeed, knowing what we do. You know, given all background uh, knowledge about come on, you, you don't even believe this. You don't even believe this yourself. Again, the quote yes, is, by, by the standards of any other area of science, this is proven. He is talking about creating another level of proof, a completely arbitrary level of proof, based on his beliefs of what is extraordinary in terms of a claim and extraordinary in terms of a proof. You, 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 uh, there's no way to intellectually defend this statement. It's, but yes, it is. There is. There is because look, I mean, when the scientist, what the scientist is doing, there are certain things that the scientist is going to take as red. You know, um, he's going to take it that the dial really does. You know, that really is number one on the dial. He can see it right there. Um, that, that's, that, that, that's not going to be a problem so far as so far as uh, he's concerned or she is concerned. It's not sexist about this. Okay. So there are certain things that uh, we're going to take on the basis of that's just how things appear to be. And scientists do that even in the laboratory. They're going to do that. Um, although they'll hopefully go away and repeat the experiment and other people will do the same kind of thing. But again, they'll just look at the dial and say, yeah, number one, okay, let's carry on. So it's not, a, it's, it's not it, the extent to which we raise the evidential bar depends on just how extraordinary the claim is how unlikely how likely it is that we would have the evidence if the claim is true and how unlikely it would be that we would have the evidence if the claim wasn't true but isn't that what science is doing isn't that what science is doing all the time isn't that what the peer review process is doing is determining what evidence we already have as our base what new evidence we should consider why yeah, would I mean, we Maybe your, maybe your view is that, you know, there is already an awful lot of evidence in for the existence of psychic powers, uh, say. Enough evidence that by the standards of any other area of science, it's proven. Those are, are Wiseman's words, and I yeah, think that, that's that true. Be, I, I can't comment on that because I'm not an expert on that area of science. But let's suppose that that's true. Um, I guess what Wise, Wiseman is saying here, I mean, and that might be true, for all I know. Um, and I, it's not that I would, I would always refused to believe that there were psychic powers. As a matter of fact, I don't. 
Um, but I'm certainly open to persuasion. But I know, for example, that scientists can be a little bit unreliable when it comes to investigating psychic phenomena. They have been duped. They have, it's on record. It has been established that scientists are really, really good when it comes to chemicals in a Petri dish, but when it comes to a couple of people in front of them, they, can, they are vulnerable to the same kind of moves and deceits that the rest of us are. It turns out they don't have any special expertise when it comes to investigating someone like Yuri Geller, for example. It turns out that they, are, they will fall for the same tricks as the man in the street. So you have to be extra, extra specially careful when it comes to investigating those kinds of things. And, and I, I can't believe that you would disagree with me about that, would you? Intellectual black hole alert. Dr. Law, this is exactly what you preach against, in, is that we are going to layer on top of this without any proof, without any evidence. I mean, if that's your claim, then someone needs to prove that, as they've tried to do so many times, and as the social they, they scientists... Have well, wait, they, have they really, we, we could get into that evidence and talk about that. But I think what you'd find is that all the work that's been done suggests that parapsychology stands above virtually every other area of science in terms of controlling for these kinds of lack of controls because they've been under such scrutiny for the last 50 years that they're more aware of this than anyone else. That's what the hard date that's what the hard data tells us. But I, 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 again, I just think the idea that, that we need to kind of layer on top of science, the, the center for... Inc A lot of these people are investigating and finding nothing. They can't replicate the experiments. They do not get the same results when they repeat the experiments that supposedly show the psychic effect. There, there is not the repeating that you would expect. And so at the very least, you should be a little bit skeptical here. You know, you, you shouldn't just assume that the reason they're not getting the result, the results when Wiseman does the experiment, he doesn't get the results. When Chris French does the experiment, he doesn't get the results. When Randy does the experiment, he doesn't get the results. But Randy, hey, okay. Randy, you really want to throw Randy in into a serious scientific debate? And again, well, if, if that's your uh, claim, if that's your claim, then you would you would I have to back that. Part. You would have to back that up. <laughs> I think we're going to get way into. Uh, you know, the details of those experiments, which we've done on this show many times, but it's really, I think, uh, probably outside of the, the aim of having you on and talking about the philosophy of it, which I think you've handled in a in an admirable way, and I've used up, I think, about all of our time. L l let's switch gears for a minute, if we could, and get off. Of no, no, let's just, oh, go, go ahead. No, no, please finish it. One second. The, it, the, the principle that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence, I think, actually, is, is self-evidently true, if you think about it in the right kind of way. And in <laughs> fact, you, if you understand it in the right kind of way, certainly if I claim to have a, thing, a, a fairy you know, in front of you and I show you what appears to be a fairy on your little TV screen there, dancing away on my hand, you, you're not, not going to take that at face value in the same way that you would take it that I have a cup on my and clearly, as the claim becomes more and more extraordinary, so the evidential bar has to be raised. And we all know that. And when it comes to claims about psychic powers and so on, these are very, very extraordinary claims. They do not fit in with our theory, our best understanding of how the universe works. And so if you're going to make those claims, you're going to have to have better evidence than the kind of evidence that you would already or, you know, ordinarily expect to have. The principle that extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence seems to me a very sensible claim to me. Well, well it, it, it seems sensible in the same way that communism seems sensible and that we should share everything among everyone except the devil, of course, is in the details. And that's who decides what is shared with whom? And so is the problem with extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. Who will decide? They agree what, with you now. That's who, good. Yes, you're coming on board with the, with the thought that extraordinary well, claims. Well, I, I, guess, I guess I'm coming on board if we had this uh, omnipotent, all-knowing being that could decide what is extraordinary in terms of claim and what is extraordinary in terms of proof. But I would submit to you that that's why we've built the scientific institutions that we have. That's why we have peer review. That's why we have 
a, a, a college of academics who collectively create this body of knowledge. They are constantly in the business of extraordinary claims and extraordinary proof. And the notion that that we could, as a kind of this armchair quarterback, say, hey, that area over there is extraordinary, I think is absurd. I think there's a thousands of little areas of inquiry of science that we know nothing about that if we went into, we might think, wow, that is extraordinary. We just don't know anything about it. Psychics, because they're on TV, strike us as extraordinary. But to the researchers who are in that field, who are publishing in those peer-reviewed journals, who are subjecting themselves to the criticism of the best critics, are are being... Well, well, some always, I mean, uh, some isn't really a qualifier here. If it's a qualifier all the time, but I'm just saying, it, how would we layer on top of this, this notion of extraordinary? How would we, how is the center for inquiry in any position to be the arbitrary of what is extraordinary? Even the people doing the research think these claims are extraordinary. They will, they will be trumpeting from the rooftops if it turns out they really can establish that some people have psychic powers, that is absolutely extraordinary and you know it. It's exciting in a way that some other rather more mundane scientific dis- discovery is not. These are extraordinary claims and it may be that we can establish that they are true and it may be that the extraordinary evidence is in. Hey, I don't know. But so far as, so far as I'm aware, there are very many people working in this area, working very, very hard, who are genuinely open-minded, who just can't see the evidence and they don't get the results results that other people do when they repeat the experiments. And on that basis, then, I think we, the, you know, the evidence just isn't there at this point. But now we're moving from talking about philosophy to talking about the evidence. I'm all for talking about the evidence, but I don't think that's a debate that really you will stand up very well in because we've looked at the evidence. The evidence has been published. The evidence isn't as you've been led to believe. The evidence is as Richard Wiseman has said right here, that by any other area of science, it's proven. That really is the dirty, dark secret here, but it gets spun in a different way. So if you want to talk about evidence, we can talk about evidence all day long. I've talked to dozens and dozens of these guys and had them on the show and hash that out including yeah i mean think about think about think think of it like this suppose somebody says look um i've got a mach- i've got a machine here that uh that i don't know it's 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 really good at uh lifting heavy weights and we we say okay well uh, yeah, that, that's that, that's not particularly surprising. Not a particularly extraordinary uh, claim. We'll test it. Let's let's produce a rig and an experiment. We'll test it in the lab to see if it really does the thing. And by golly, by golly, it it does. It you know it passes the test. Okay. So now this guy comes in. He says, I've got this other machine. It's a perpetual motion machine. Uh, he wheels it in. He says, now just do the same experiment. I don't want you to change anything. The same standards that you applied to my first machine, I want you to apply those exact same standards to this machine. And if it passes, then you have to tell the world that my perpetual motion machine really works. Um, I don't think that would be fair. Because the first machine doesn't, is not revolutionary and extraordinary in the way that the second machine is. That second machine has to be investigated much more carefully. And the standards applied have to be far more rigorous because of the truly extraordinary nature of the claim that's being presented to us. That's what extraordinary claims require extraordinary evidence means. And it's true. Well, well, Stephen, I, I, I just beg to differ. I, I don't think you're intimately familiar with the data. Dr. Dean Radin is someone I just interviewed on the last episode of Skeptico. I invite it's, him to contribute to Think. I've published his stuff. That's great. I mean, here is someone, let's, let's, let's just dive into, dip into then a little bit of the details of some data. You know, so he okay. ran this experiment called a presentiment experiment. And the reason he set this up is because it's a common experiment that's been run on freshman college students for decades. And that's that you hook them up to some kind of biometric device, various different ones to measure their reaction. And you flash a picture on the computer screen. And it's either a a, a non, you know, exciting picture of just a pastoral scene or something like that, or it's something very provocative, like sex or violence or something like that. And then he wanted to measure the reaction from those people. What he found was a reaction before 
the photo was even selected by the computer. It's a very small reaction, but it's repeatable. He has repeated this experiment, Stephen, uh, over 50 times in seven different labs. It's been repeated around the world. And Not it, just by him. By other, by other people. By other people, by other people, yes. By yeah. him, dozens of times. By other labs, other than him, at least nine times, was- if by the, on the last count. It's been published yeah. in numerous peer-reviewed journals. So, yeah. you know, here is an example of the kind of evidence that yeah. Richard Wiseman is talking about when he says, hey, by any other measure of, of science, a guy does an experiment, repeats the experiment, makes the experiment public. This is proof. It's just not accepted because it doesn't fit within our paradigm, not because it's extraordinary, but because of the implications of what that would mean for you talk about a measurement problem. Okay, now we have to measure the fact that you are somehow aware of things that are happening before they happen. Well, you can see how unsettling that is to science. Yeah, it would be extraordinary. It's extraordinary claim requires extraordinary evidence. (laughs) Yes, yes, yes. Now, has anyone attempted to repeat that? <laughs> has anyone attempted to repeat that experiment and failed to repeat it? I don't know. I'm sure they. I'm sure they have. I, he he deals at great length with the file drawer problem. I mean, this guy is a very accomplished uh, yeah, 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 yeah. scientist. I don't doubt it. You know. Yeah, I don't doubt it. But you know, if people have attempted to re- replicate the experiment and have not. Which he received, you know, got, got yes, the same yes, result. Yes, 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 yes. The file, the file drawer problem. But you're a philosopher. I am a entrepreneur and a podcaster. We're not, we're not the ones to really say, you know, to, to figure out those stats. He has. He's published them in his book, uh, in his many books, and he's talked specifically about estimating what the file drawer problem might be, and he's calculated that into his calculations. Yeah, well, because because I know that, for example, Chris French has attempted to, well, has repeated experiments, has failed to get the result that other people have got, and when he's tried to publish that in the peer-reviewed journals, they refuse. And they refuse because they they're only interested in in, in publishing uh, positive results, not negative results. Okay, yeah, the, no, the null effect the null effect isn't very uh, newsworthy or doesn't really make it into uh, many journals, does it? I got the null effect. Yeah. Yeah. So so look, you know, it may be that this can be established. Uh, I'm all I'd be very I, you know it's extraordinary. I'd love to believe it was true. It's very exciting, uh, but you know the evidence is going to have to be pretty damn extraordinary. Uh, maybe it is already. I don't know. I'm not an expert in this area. I look forward to seeing more of it. Well, well, you are an expert in any number of things, including, I, I don't want to say, you know what I was just about to say, this would be a terrible thing. You're an expert in bullshit. <laughs> but I mean that, I mean that in a very, very nice way, in a positive way, because you're yeah. the author again of this very interesting book that a lot of people will find useful for these kind of dorm room debates that we get into, whether we still live in a dorm or not. And that is the book's title is Believing Bullshit, How Not to Get Sucked into an Intellectual Black Hole. Before we let you go, Dr. Law, tell us about some other projects that you're working on, what's going on at the journal Think, and and anything else that might be going on in your world. Yeah, well, I edit the journal Think for the Royal Institute of Philosophy, which is a journal aimed at everyone. So, you know, anyone and everyone should be able to read it and understand the stuff that's published in there. We try and make it accessible uh, and interesting to a general to the general public. Um, I've been I've been working on some new children's books ideas. I've published uh, philosophy books for children in the past. Probably the best known one is the Philosophy Files, which I think was known as Philosophy Rocks in the United States of America. Um, in fact, that's got a chapter on weird and mysterious things in actually the, the second volume of that, the the, the, the complete Philosophy Files. Um, so I'm hoping to do a bit more work with kids and critical thinking and just getting them to think rigorously and carefully about this stuff, which I'm sure you know, you'd, you, you'd be very much in favor of too. You'd, you'd agree with that. Absolutely. Don't think of me as a debunker, okay? You think of the Center for Inquiry as the debunking organization. Now, I'd like to think of myself as just that, uh, you know, I, I, there are many of these claims that I would love to be true. I would love it to be true, right, that, some, that there is some kind of precognition ability that we have, um, because it would be so exciting. Uh, it would it would completely undermine and challenge 
so much of what we believe about how the world works. Um, it would open up new vistas for us. Um, so it's not that I'm a, it's not that I'm in principle against such beliefs. It's just that before I believe anything like that, boy, somebody's going to have to give me some pretty great evidence. And as you've already agreed, you know, extraordinary claims really do require pretty extraordinary evidence. So let's get that evidence in. Maybe maybe it's there already. Let's find out. I'm always leery of anyone who says, I'd love this to be true. I've heard that so many times. I have to say, in my heart of hearts, I don't know that I would love for this to be true any more than I'd love for anything else that I believe in to be shown to me to not be true. I don't know that that's a comfortable process. What I know is that I'm committed to following the data wherever it takes me and being fully open to exploring the fact that I might be being duped by, as you said in that quote that I really liked, either by someone else or by myself into thinking something that isn't true. Yeah, we all need to be very, very aware of that. Uh, we need to make sure that we're not led by wishful thinking, uh, that we don't use mystery as a way of immunizing our beliefs and protecting what we believe against uh, any kind of intellectual threat. Uh, and so on. It's important for all sorts of reasons, not just when it comes to the investigation of the paranormal. So we're all on board with that, which is good, I think. Well, Dr. Law, it's been great having you on. I certainly enjoyed such a spirited discussion and a lot of great stuff here. Thanks again for joining me. My pleasure. It's fun. Thanks a lot. Thanks again to Dr. Law for joining me today on Skeptico. I have a couple of questions I'd tee up from this interview. The first would be, are you a biological robot? It's something we talked about in this interview. Of course, this is the claim made by Richard Dawkins that really is at the core, the underbelly of the atheist claim, and that's that you are a machine, an electrochemical robot that is driven by genetic instincts and environmental programming and you are nothing more. So to me, that seems absolutely absurd. I think the philosophical argument for that is absurd, but I'd love to hear someone come forward and explain how they are a biological robot and that they accept that and that's how they live their life. I'd love to hear from you, and I hope you join us and answer that question in the affirmative so we can talk to you. And the second question, since we spent so much time talking about it in this interview, is does it make any sense from a, from a philosophy of science perspective to proclaim that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof? Now, you know my opinion on this, not only from this show, but from many previous shows. But it was interesting to joust a little bit with Dr. Law on this and hash it out once again. So I'd love to get your perspective on that. Is there a way to reasonably support that claim that somehow extraordinary claims require this level of extraordinary proof? I'd love to hear your opinion on that as well as on the first question. Of course, the place to do that is at the Skeptico website at S-K-E-P-T-I-K. Don't forget the K. O.com. While you're there, you can drop us a comment right there on the website. Click and bounce over to the forum where there's usually a lot going on, or drop me an email or connect with me on Facebook. While you're at the Skeptico website, be sure to check out over our 200 previous episodes. Lots of good stuff in there. It's all free, available for download from the website. And I always love to hear from listeners who discover Skeptico and then are and then are inspired to dig into some of those old episodes. I have to say, I do the same thing when I find a, a podcast that I'm really turned on to that I didn't know before. It's a great surprise to find that there's so many previous shows that I can go back and listen to. I really enjoy doing that. And of course, I enjoy it when someone finds Skeptico and goes through the same process. So if that's you, I welcome you to do it. I have a number of interesting shows coming up on Skeptico. They're coming along at a pretty good pace, and they're certainly not slowing down. I'll have to see how I do keeping up, but I'll do my best. But that's going to do it for this episode. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.